Hello, welcome to the Sunday Science Q&A. Uh, I, uh, I missed last week. I hope you had, uh, I, I know it was an absolutely fantastic panel. Uh, to well, In fact, it was it was basically a sequel, the same panel talking about mental health. I just made it to, to Belfast in time. I will explain that. Uh, and, I, and I was sitting at my desk all ready, uh, but said thank heavens we've sacked him but tragically i'm back so i do apologize for that um a few little things before we get started by the way today we're kind of again this is another show we had so many questions uh about evolution in particular uh in terms of some of the uh remarkable revelations and discoveries and new ideas that we have about neanderthals so we're mainly going to be talking about uh that today and uh just a few other things that are going on at the moment one is we've done our second episode of an uncanny hour uh the first episode was about the ealing portmanteau film dead of night the second one is about Hawkwind in the 1970s and the countercultural movement and we have Stuart lee and alan moore and uh, new order Stephen Morris and uh, Stacey, who was part of uh, Hawkwind in the uh, in the 1970s, on that, and uh, and lots of other people. And so, thank you very much, everyone who supports us via Patreon, because that's how we're able to make documentaries like that. Um, and uh, also to tell you that the latest science book shambles is up. It is uh, with Gavin Francis, a book called Island Dreams, which is about um, both our real and our imagined uh, relationships um, with the ocean of islands, islands, the idea of of islands ourselves and it's a really very very beautiful book by the way i would highly recommend it um and uh, another thing is oh the uh, the poem that i did uh um sandman hugs and final den someone on instagram had uh, the idea of turning it into a, an art print so i got my friend john to do a beautiful illustration for that though those are available now we're doing a limited edition uh set of those and have a look at cosmic shambles.com where you will also find out about our 24 hour show that starts on midday the 12th of december and ends Yes, you've guessed it, midday the 13th of uh, December, with a certain amount of overrun. Uh, and we've got, I think now, about 117 um, guests announced for that, including uh, Brian Cox and Sophie Ellis-Bexter and Chris Hadfield and Jocelyn bell and uh, obviously about somewhere between another uh, 110 and another 123 people on top of that. So, uh, welcome. Oh, my God, I've just looked. Trent's got There's even more thing. It's not me who does this, by the way. It's Trent. Trent says, I need to all that the genetic sham the kind of the final episode of art from a very very final episode on the 24 hour show uh we're doing that i'll be talking to uh, professor steve jones who many of you will know from his books like uh, almost like a whale and uh darwin's garden and uh, know that he finds uh the study of genetics and his job uh which is to make sex boring so we'll be doing an extremely boring conversation about sex <laughs> Day uh, with Steve Jones. So um, today we have uh, again people, both of whom have been on Genetic Shambles. Uh, we have Professor Chris Stringer, who's research leader in human evolution at the Natural History, History, Museum. History Museum, and we have Dr. Rebecca Rag Sykes, who uh, new her book, new book Kindred, Kindred is out now. And uh, I, I don't know if, if I can't recommend it highly enough. I'll just recommend it really highly because it is just a really beautifully written book about exactly what we're talking about today, which is the new discoveries about Neanderthals, our connections with them. Uh, uh, their culture, uh, their the idea of rituals. There's many, many different things in that. So that is today's show. Let's go straight to Helen Chersky with her show and tell. One of which is she's done an incredible job today. We, we've we had a lot of technical difficulties today, a lot of things in different people. Say. It's like it kind of postponed Friday the 13th. We sailed through that. Sunday the 15th, though, it appears, then this is when it really kicked in. And she is very precariously balanced the one bit of technology that works. She is currently sitting in a yoga position. She's not in a normal chair. At any point, this could go awry. Welcome to the jeopardy of your show and tell. Yeah, he's not actually joking either. It really is. If, if, if things start to wobble, it's it's not me being sort of drunk on Skype. Um, so my show and tell this week. So I have decided that we've gone, we've gone past a lot of the sensible things or relatively sensible because you've all seen them. So I thought it was time to introduce you to my collection of plush toy sea creatures. Um, and in particular, this one here, which is not only a sort of a plush toy squid, but it's actually a puppet. So you can do squid things with him like this. Um, but this is from Te Papa in, New in Wellington, New Zealand, where, where they have on display. I think it's still the only colossal squid actually on public display in the world. The Natural History Museum have one, but it's, I think they've got one. It's either that or a giant squid. Anyway, it's in the basement somewhere. Where you can't see it. Chris knows these things. Um, they've actually got two nose to tail in the same very long tank. It's a bit disconcerting. Anyway, so this giant squid here, apart from being, you know, a reasonably 
the fatal representation of a colossal squid, which would normally be uh, three or four meters long and weigh 500 kilos and all those things. And the reason I thought about the colossal squid, clearly not having very much to say about human evolution, but I just thought on the topic of evolution. So it is my understanding that the giant, the colossal squid has the largest eye known uh, anywhere in the natural world at the moment. And the actual size of its eye, you can see my globe back there, which is about uh, 40 centimetres across. So that that is how big the eyes of these things get. And just because the eye, whenever you talk about, you know, it was, a, it was a topic for Darwin, it's been a topic for people who don't like evolution, but the evolution of the eye always comes up. So I just thought it was nice to actually look at the size of a natural colossal squid eye and uh, for you all to meet the squid. Now, this is interesting because you, you said so far in terms of what we know, it's the largest eye. What kind of uh, kraken, etc., are you imagining maybe something we haven't yet found in the deep sea, which has an even larger eye? Well, the only reason I hesitate is that um, people, we don't know a huge amount about very deep sea squid species. And we know about the colossal squids and the giant squids because they tend to get eat, they have fights with sperm whales, basically. So quite often when sperm whales are when it was whaling and they were fished up, they would they would vomit up giant squid, actually, because it is that's a thing that animals do when they're being chased. You want to get rid of weight, vomit up the, the, the giant squid. And so we've seen lots of bits of giant squid and colossal squid. And I don't think anyone knows how many species of colossal squid there are, you know, there could be subspecies. So so we don't know. We're not very good at finding them. And I think there's only there might now be one video of one actually swimming. Um, but up till then, it's all just been dead ones washed up. So so we really don't know a lot about them because basically they're far better uh, in the dark than we are. And the last thing that is really cool, actually, the other reason that the eye is relevant is this super cool thing, because um, the, the sperm whale and the giant, the colossal squid are these big you know, more literally mortal enemies. But the thing is that the giant squid can't hear and the sperm whale can't see very well. So that one of them is looking with one of them is fighting by, you know, it's using sound to work out what's going on around it. And the other one is using light and bio, tiny bits of bioluminescence. So they're basically having a battle from entirely different perspectives, which is just a super cool idea. So anyway, yes, that's a great pity that Jacques Cousteau broaden out into more fictional based slapstick movies because that has a delight written all over it and that is the eye is so fascinating because uh, I, I was um we, we did an infinite monkey cage about flies recently which i think is going out in january and, and apparently 22 different times that the uh, different forms of fly have evolved the eye you know we often talk about that separate yes. part of the evolution. In fact, I and wrote, that to me is fascinating i wrote about fly eyes this week i have a column for the wall street oh, journal and i wrote, and I wrote about, about the reason, the reason that fly, that fly eyes, eyes get don't... fogged up um, and the reason that, our, you know, if we put anti-fog coating on glasses, it's basically a wet solution. What it does is it takes all the little droplets of condensation and forces them to spread out into one single thin layer. So the water is still there. It's just that it doesn't interfere with your vision. And what the flies do is on the surface of their, so they've got the eye, they've got compound eyes. They're made up of lots of little individual kind of cone shaped things with little dome on top. But those domes have even tinier domes, like a sort of um, pattern of dimples inverted dimples um, and they basically form an air cushion under the droplets and there's a little bit of wax on the surface and, and the and water droplets just roll off so flies have dry eyes and there are these amazing pictures of flies in humid environments and they've got like droplets of water hanging like baubles that have condensed on all the hairy bits of their legs and their head but their eyes are completely clear so yes fly eyes have a lot going for them Oh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of, and, and some quite lurid tales as well from our guest on that. Now, Chris, now, Chris uh, uh, you, uh, we're, it's always exciting to have a show and tell where someone who might have a spare set of keys for some of the dry stores in the Natural <laughs> History Museum, so we never know what you've you've pilfered over the weekend. What is your show and tell for us? For us? Okay, well, it's, uh, it's appropriate, really, because it happens to be uh, a replica of a Neanderthal fossil skull. So this is the one from La Ferrocie in France, the original was part of a skeleton found in, I think, 1909, and it's one of the most complete and sort of iconic Neanderthals. So it's got, you know, it's got the typical Neanderthal features. It's got this big nose and the face is pulled forwards. It's got that double arch brow ridge over the eyes. Great big brain, as big as ours, a bit bigger than the modern average for this one. And it's got that spherical shape when you look at it from behind almost circular shape from behind. And uh, yeah, it's part of a skeleton. So this is a male individual, uh, quite a muscly, strongly built guy. And he's got very worn teeth. 
especially at the front. So partly he was probably holding stuff in his jaws, maybe chewing skins and manipulating stuff, which has led to this high tooth wear. That's great. Now, it interests me that, you know, someone that you've, you've been around artifacts like this for many years. And of course, in the last 20 years, as we will be talking about, we've, there's a, a great change in the understanding of that story. Do, how does that change? I don't mean in terms of factually or scientifically, but in terms of, is there a change when you look sometimes at those artifacts? And now that you know things about the possibilities in, of, of, in terms of its culture and all those things, does that change what you see? Yeah, well, it was argued about straight away when this was discovered, whether it was an intentional burial. And in fact, uh, and Becky can talk more about this, but there were a number of individuals buried in this site, possibly even a family group. So there's a, a female Neanderthal buried there as well, and several very young individuals. So it, you know, it's been interpreted by some people as a Neanderthal cemetery. So it's one of the important sites from that point of view. And what's interesting about La Ferrisi is that, you know, we keep revisiting it and learning new things about it. So uh, obviously with CT scanning, we can look inside the skull. We can look at the ear bones, things we've never seen in reality. But CT imaging can show us hidden structures. And we're learning about those in the Neanderthals. And even some of those structures are distinctive from ours. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, we're going to be talking a lot more about the, about these. Uh, with uh, so, and I should say, by the way, everyone, if you have got questions that you, uh, we've got a lot that have been sent in already over the last couple of days. But also, if you've got a question now, then uh, send them to either our, our Twitter account as Cosmic Sh at Cosmic Shambles, um, or you can send it. I think there's somewhere beneath what you're looking at now uh, in the chat box. You'll be able to send that, and I will find out those questions. We'll ask live questions as well. Um, Rebecca, what have you got for us for your show and tell? I have um, a stone object this is a replica um but i'll hold it so that you can see so this is what we call a bi face it has two main faces um and this is the kind of thing that neanderthals did make um did make objects like this but this sort of plan form of an artifact um that's based on understanding geometry that you have two faces you work each face this goes back m massively further than neanderthals so it's the earliest uh, examples of these you probably also have heard them called hand axes um they go back well beyond 1.8 uh, million years ago so this is far older in the homo uh, lineage um before neanderthals um but i i like this because um, this was made uh, for me by a friend. This is Flint, um, but it's it's beautiful. I mean, we as archaeologists have a tendency to sort of see aesthetic values in symmetry, and there's a lot of interesting evolutionary sort of theories and and data on on the value of symmetry in animal bodies as health indicators. But exactly what's going on with symmetry? in artifacts is something that is still very much debated however with neanderthals these are actually not that hard to make although they look beautiful um they you can whack one out in 20 minutes if you're a good napper and we would assume all neanderthals were napping all the time um but in some cases in some of the pieces made by neanderthals they seem to be sort of keen to keep the symmetry during the initial stages um and then they use them and retouch them on one side and that side starts to shrink down and the asymmetry disappears. Um, in other cases, if they break it, they might remake it in a different side and then they make it symmetrical again. So there's something interesting going on there. We don't quite understand it, but <laughs> I, always I like love that. Statements. I think it's in, in Jacob Manofsky's Ascent of Man where he just stands in one of those, what is basically, <laughs> basically a field of, uh, of 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 flint tools that is just you know built out. It's, it's it's a beautiful, still such a beautiful show. Let's start off now. I mentioned before that Steve Jones is is with us on Wednesday to make sex <clears> boring. <throat> so uh, let's start off with a, a sex question from Paul Folds. Um, how do modern humans evolve if sexual selection has moved beyond survival of the fittest? Rebecca, would you be up for answering that? So so he's asking how do how we do humans evolve? evolve if sexual selection has moved beyond survival of the fittest? How, how do we evolve? Are we evolving in the future or how have we evolved? Or I suppose what he's saying is how how does it change now? I mean, in some ways, I think the survival um, of the fittest thing is a bit of a is a bit of a, a, a kind of curveball there because we still 
you you might still say that it, that it is still about survival of the fittest, but it depends on various. It depends different... on what fitness is, which yes. is going to be very much contextual. Um, and you know what is uh, a body a that's body... survivable and useful in some contexts right now is not the same as in other contexts. Looking globally, um, and I think also, I mean, this. I think Chris probably will actually have a better handle on this in terms of broad evolutionary trends in anatomy but I, I think sort of sexual selection and fitness they may sort of intersect somewhat as well um so I think I think that question is I don't think we have moved beyond selection in terms of fitness I, I don't know Chris would probably want to come in as well Chris in as well Chris Yes, I'm tempted to say leave that for Steve Jones, but I suppose <laughs> we we'll have to deal with it. Um, okay, yeah, so obviously, you know, even with Darwin, there was quite a debate about whether natural selection or sexual selection was more important, particularly for humans, uh, and Darwin actually favoured sexual selection. So I think even for, let's say, the Neanderthals, um, this brow ridge that they have and all early humans have, there is a debate about whether that might actually be selected for through cultural or we can call it sexual selection so the brow ridge on many of these early humans is very large and contrasts with us of course and yet a lot of them are actually pretty well hollow inside so they've got virtually no compact bone in them and therefore it's very difficult to think of a function that they had in terms of anatomy so there is a view that they're kind of the equivalent of deer antlers that they are there to signal um, so perhaps these individuals stared aggressively at each other when they were threatening each other. They didn't have big canine teeth, so they glared at each other, maybe. And these brow ridges accentuated that stare. So the stare might be, you know, keep away from my food, keep away from my partner, whatever it was. And these actually were selected um, culturally, and therefore they, they're there for a, a social reason and not for a functional anatomical reason. So... If that's true, then sexual selection is certainly at work. And I think when we look at modern human variation around the world, again, Darwin might have been right that some of the features we see that differentiate human populations, for example, the shape of the eyes or the shape of the lips, the kind of hair we have, may be sexual or perhaps rather cultural selection could be at work with different standards of attractiveness around the world. So, yeah. So I think there is something in that um, in terms of our evolution. Yes. But there's well, something really interesting going on. If we look at the four of us, you three are wearing glasses and I am wearing contact lenses. And I have always said that I should have been eaten by a leopard at the age of three because I am very, very short sighted. And, you know, there is no way I would have been able to do, do the sorts of things in the world if I didn't have a technological aid to help me do it. And I, I wonder if that's the question that the questioner is getting at. It's that we're, we're removing some selection pressures basically because technology is is help, they don't matter anymore you know as long as we can make glasses being myopic stops being yeah. a problem but we we add others as well because you have a very western uh, office based lifestyle it's going to help you to have a cardiovascular system that can cope with less exercise and so you're not going to have a stroke at the age of 60 so oh, well, there will be different me. fitness things going on i'm done yeah. twice over not only should i have been eaten by a leopard but i need i need exercise like i'm like a very energetic dog that needs exercise all the time i'm not cut out for office life so yeah I'm, i shouldn't be here <laughs> yeah if it, yeah, wasn't, if it wasn't lockdown if anyone watching that we always take helen out to the park afterwards between four and five and just throw her various different things that we stolen from dry store number one in the uh, natural history museum um i just wanted to add chris it's interesting when you talk about the brows there because didn't darwin talk about because obviously with, with our eyebrows there have been lots of different ideas some people would say well it, actually it's just because of sweat getting in the eyes but didn't darwin say again about the uh, geez, emotion that we are able to see negative emotion from a far greater distance than positive emotion so therefore when you see negative emotion you go oh i think i'll leave that for the time being i don't think i'll bring that up now yeah, I, th I think eyebrows are certainly part of our social uh, signalling system. And there's lots of video stuff online where you, you just see these very subtle little eyebrow movements that we make when we're happy or sad. And those are signalling to other people. So, yeah, this is part of this argument about the brow ridges that actually one of the papers that discusses brow ridge evolution and the fact we don't have big brow ridges is that allegedly our eyebrows have become more important and more visible. Uh, by not having these big brow ridges, our eyebrows actually take on much more of a social signal and 
apparently there are little muscles that we've got, which say chimpanzees don't have, which do move our eyebrows. So certainly there could be a social signal. Well, you know what's interesting as well? Um, there's, I'm sure there's new research that's just come out that the other... And so it with with the eyebrows and the emotion stuff, we don't necessarily have to assume that it's about aggression because dogs do sort of they do the oh the sad eyebrow face and there's this other potential for for emotional signalling and and the mobility of the brows and everything. So I find that super interesting that dogs do it. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that in cartoons, you know, if you look at people can line draw cartoons of a cat and it can be two eyes and a mouth and eyebrows. And humans know exactly what emotion it is. It's basically three lines on a dot. And we can all say it's happy or sad. It's, it's mm. absolutely astonishing, I find that. Yeah. And I think for people like Neanderthals, uh, I think for people like Neanderthals, of course, we don't know whether they had exactly the same signaling as we do. Was their smile reflex the same as ours, for example? Uh, those are things which we don't know about and whether we ever will know. Uh, but they're fascinating to think of because obviously we did encounter Neanderthals. So... You know, these interactions could have been these first interactions could have been quite important between them. Well, the next question actually is about uh, the uh, the interaction. Yeah, yeah. This is from uh, Steve uh, and Rebecca. He'd like to know: Does the evidence of long term interbreeding with Neanderthals mean that they are the same species as us? And this question, I think, comes up quite often. It's an interesting mm. thing of people understanding how it becomes just this this small amount left over. Yeah, well, I mean, I think when you talk about is it a species? Is it not a species? We have to remember, you know, biologists are faced with natural diversity and we have to create some kind of classification system. One of the definitions for species is can they interbreed? Um, so in that sense, yes. But you also need to look at the history of those two species. How long ago was it that they separated? And in terms of us and Neanderthals, it's actually really recent, you know, like 700 odd thousand years ago. That's not a lot. So we are two very closely related populations that did separate. And although there are multiple phases now, we can see from the genetics from many different fossils, they are they're pointing to, to multiple phases going back before 200,000 years. There was still enough separation that that we we each as two different lineages maintained the morphological, you know, distinctiveness. So they are i would call them closely related um you know populations maybe some people have called them allotaxa in terms of what happens with other animals um like yaks and cows they can interbreed um things like this so i think it's something similar to that but in terms of i think chris would probably agree in terms of just the the gross morphology they are still even at 40,000 years ago when they disappear after this long period of occasional interbreeding they still look very different to us Yes, I think that uh, I think yeah. that uh, you know, I've, I've even written something on the Natural History we website about this, which people could look at. But yeah, I mean, um, morphologically, if we use the standards we apply in other primates to differentiate species, we clearly are distinct from the Neanderthals, not just in features of the skull that I've talked about, the shape of our rib cage, the shape of our pelvis, the shape of our little ear bones inside our ears. They are very distinct. So that talks of a long genetic separation at least you know Rebecca's mentioned half a million years or more but it wasn't long enough to make reproductive isolation and that's something we learn now from genetics that actually when you look at the genomes of many closely related bird species and mammal species they do interbreed a bit so this is something that actually happens a lot we, we make a big thing of it about us and Neanderthals but actually for closely related species, it, it's very common. So yeah, yeah. I, I think we have to accept, yes, we, we're distinct morphologically enough to be different species, but that wasn't a difference that separated us enough that we couldn't interbreed. And clearly we did. And we interbred with these other people, the Denisovans, that we know about over in the Far East as well. Yeah. I mean, does that mean somewhere there, there should be, the, hopefully, the remnants of a child of a Neanderthal and a homo sapien that the uh, and what would we see what would we 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 know of you know what what would we expect in terms of how they might structurally appear yeah in absolutely yeah i mean they they clearly they clearly must, must have existed uh, for the denisovans and neanderthals we know they interbred and there is a first generation hybrid known 
that is about 50% Neanderthal and 50% Denisovan. Unfortunately, it's only known as a tiny fragment, So, it's, but but with its full genome. So we don't know what that looked like for us and Neanderthals, yes. Um, we don't know what that hybrid would look like and, and probably the mix would be different between different pairings. They wouldn't all look the same. Um, but they must have existed or we wouldn't have that DNA today uh, in modern humans. Rebecca, you were going to... Uh, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, we do know they exist um, genetically. And as Chris said, we we amazingly have a hybrid individual from Denisova cave between Denisovans, which are closely related to Neanderthals more than us, um, and, and, and Neanderthals. But... You know, what I find fascinating there, and, and many people have, have raised this as soon as it happened, was the likelihood of finding that individual as a, a, a mixed child seemed, before we found that, absolutely mind-bogglingly unlikely that we would ever find a fossil from that. So what that seems to suggest to me is that when the conditions were there, hybridising must have been quite normal in the context or that particular chronological period where the conditions were right where those two populations were there where they were able to interact however they, we still know that there must have been large spans of time when hybridizing was not happening but in terms of what they look like um it does it, it is important how related the species are and and you know chimpanzees and bonobos are i believe they separated on a on a similar time scale to us and neanderthals and you know they don't look that different although if you look at their bones you know you can differentiate them but a hybrid between those two would not look as bizarrely different as a hybrid between a narwhal and a beluga which exists and that thing does not look like either parent species but that's because those two species separated millions of years ago compared to you know where they were when that hybridization happened so i think people have to understand we are actually on the grand scale of evolution we're very closely related to neanderthals now the next question i'm, I'm not on social media so helen you you'll be able to help, you, you'll be able to help me with this uh, brianna would like to know why is everyone be arguing about neanderthals on twitter all week <laughs> Oh, have they? I I clearly I'm out of touch. I've, all I'm doing is working at them. I am not up on the latest Neanderthal Twitter gossip. Uh, oh, your like Google alert post. is just whale poo, isn't it? That's all it says, doesn't it? Google alert whale poo. Shh. Look, it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a bubble physicist. I don't want all yeah. the other bubble people to think I'm ignoring my real job. Anyway, so, Becky, Becky knows about the. What, what uh, has the been going on then, Rebecca? What what what, uh, what are these arguments? There was a bit of Neander, Neander beef. <laughs> on twitter um uh, if it's what i think the question is referring to um there was an article written uh, for the conversation which is a website that uh, allows academics to to write for the public essentially um and therefore has uh, the impression of being quite reliable in terms of its information. Um, an article was written for them um, by uh, somebody who is a specialist in dinosaurs and fossil lizards and the article claims that there is basically really good evidence that there was actual war between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. So the question of is there conflict, legitimate question and whatever, but the claims made in that article went far beyond any of the evidence that we have for conflict, which is basically virtually nothing. Um, there is evidence for physical injuries, but actual evidence for conflict is incredibly rare. Um, and so the fact that this article was published um, sort of, I guess, upset people because the conversation is is understood to be quite a reliable source and was that article was shared by the BBC. Then it went to Yahoo. Then it went all over the place. And everyone's like, oh, my God, there was a war between the Antithos and Homo sapiens. No, um, we have absolutely no evidence at all from their bodies or the archaeology for that. So. As far as I understand it, that's probably what they're asking about. Oh, well, that, that, that's not uh, Phosphine and Venus, out Venus the, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, main kind of spats at the moment. So, that, so that's good. Um, Chris, this is uh, from Wayne. Wayne would like to know how many species stroke subspecies of Neanderthal do we know of? Well, OK, that depends on how we, how we diagnose a species. So for me, uh, I tend to think there's only one species of Neanderthal that we know of. So I tend to say that the Neanderthals are a long are a lineage that lasted hundreds of thousands of years. And I call everything on that lineage that has Neanderthal distinctive features, and I call them 
Neanderthals, and I refer them to that species. Probably, you know, if you had a bigger sample, you could make some extra species. So there are very early fossils on the Neanderthal lineage, about 400,000 years old, from the Cima del Huesos in Spain. So in that site, you've got a fantastic sample in a deep cave uh, near Burgos in northern Spain. There are over 6,000 fossils in one small cave chamber deep in the cave. So there's a first mystery of how they all got down there. And this is the remains of probably 29 individuals that lived 400,000 years ago. It's even yielded DNA. So we know from their genomic DNA that they're on the Neanderthal line and their teeth look very like Neanderthal teeth. But in the skull, they are distinct. They've got smaller brains um, and they've got other features. Their face is less specialised, shall we say, than the Neanderthal one. So they're early members of the Neanderthal lineage. I call them Homo neanderthalensis in the Neanderthal species. Some people think they should have a different name representing a more primitive species on the Neanderthal lineage. So you might say there are two species there then. The Denisovans, uh, as Becky has said there, they're an offshoot, an early offshoot of the Neanderthal line. Uh, we don't know enough about them morphologically. We know they've got very big teeth. They don't look like Neanderthals in their teeth but we await the discovery of a really complete Denisovan fossil. But probably they are a distinct group. Maybe if the Neanderthals are a distinct species, they should also be a distinct species as well. Yeah. Could you just, one of the things I think people find really hard, because everything's a long time ago, basically. So when you're talking about, could you, could you tell us when Neanderthals, some pro, you know, I recognise numbers depend on things that depend, right? When they came along, when they disappeared, and perhaps where these boundaries in the middle were i mean and and had you know how much did humans change in the time that neanderthals kept on changing that kind of thing uh, okay so yeah so becky's mentioned already the separation time uh, genetically the the dna suggests a separation maybe 500 600 perhaps even 700,000 years ago so a long time in recent historical terms but not a long time in earth history terms so let's say 600,000 years or so. And these fossils from the Cima de la Huesos are about 400,000 years old. So they're, they're some way down the line. Um, and the Neanderthals, of course, we know went physically extinct around 40,000 years ago. Uh, there's some debate about the exact date, uh, but, you know, after about 40,000, uh, you know, in terms of fossil remains, we lose sight of Neanderthals. In terms of the archaeology, Becky might talk about the latest Neanderthal archaeology, uh, but physically uh, they seem to disappear around 40,000 years ago. Genetically, in DNA terms, they didn't disappear because they live on a bit. Right, I'm just going to quickly say, um, uh, I've got a slight technical problem problem at the moment so uh i'm going to ask you the next question i may well then disappear helen trent will then send you some of the questions that have just come in online uh i'm going to yeah. though throw first of all this is a question from uh mike mason um which is since speciation uh now appears more common than first thought are the chinese on something by suggesting peking man isn't the heidelbergensis he seems to be Bergensis he seems to be does that make sense <laughs> well <laughs> so that one <laughs> I mean, go for it i don't know, I don't many, know many people who call peking man heidelbergensis i'm not sure where that comes from um they're usually regarded as homo erectus so this species that was around uh for over a million years known from africa known from java known from china so yeah, i've never uh, recall you know called those specimens heidelbergensis there are some later chinese fossils um, like Dali, Dali, all the, the, the some people have people have been consistent. But, uh, but yes, yeah, so I think the Peking remains are Homo erectus. Some people argue that there should even be more than one species there of Homo erectus. So there'll be one in Java, another in China, another one in Africa. But that's a separate debate. In terms of morphology, they're very erectus like, they're not like Hydrobagensis. So they're more primitive, I would say. It's I a think complicated if, if, question. Oh, go on, yeah, if the questioner is is our expectations of the diversity of hominins that are around uh, at all, then I think um, I think Chris would probably uh, agree. You know, Asia is super exciting. Um, there is a lot of very interesting fossils there that don't 
match what we see in Western Eurasia. You know, I say Eastern Eurasia, I should say, rather than Western where we are. Um, East Asia and South Asia, Asia, South Asia, Asia, Southeast. There is so much going on there, and you know, I think the 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 complexity in terms of the the species that have been hidden because we never had fossils, but we saw them genetically, like the Denisovans. Um, you know, how all that ties together is a big question. We don't even know the easternmost extent of the Neanderthal sort of realm, if you want to call it that. We don't know where they got. Did they stop in Siberia where we see them at Denisova Cave or did they go further? We don't know. So in terms of what should we expect in terms of diversity, I think everyone would agree that that it's, it's going to be even more complicated than we've seen right now, for sure. I can see it sort of holds things what's the answer there must be a thing we can draw it on the diagram and that's the answer. evolution doesn't really work like that so we've got a question here from hugh which takes us on to another one but the first one is um what sort of evidence might be what might we use to find a date for the development or emergence of language um because again this is another one of those things where it's not it's not language or not right you know we know that chimps and dogs make noises that mean certain things so so what do we know how do we know what what is the evidence for language is there any becky do you want to try that one first Um, first? i think i think i mean you've you've got two different sort of zones of evidence you've got archaeology and people will debate intensely over do you need language to make one of these (laughs) um do you need language to arrange to hunt some woolly rhinoceros or not so that's that's its own question and that's very hard to address but in terms of the anatomy um i when i'm asked this and chris chris might correct me if i misunderstand it but i understand now that overall the evidence is that neanderthals could make a, a roughly similar range of sounds not identical some of the vowels may be different but sort of the placement of their voice box used to be regarded as quite sort of dodgy but less so and and I think that the inner ear anatomy as well has been has been modeled although it looks different to ours um the sounds that they're tuned into are actually the same as us which is speech and so if Neanderthals if if that anatomy is retained in Neanderthals despite the changes in their skull shape um and we do are doing that too that implies our common ancestor five to seven hundred thousand years ago was also using some kind of vocal communication as a major part of their lives but how that translates into language is a different question again because you know what we're doing right now is extremely complicated I'm thinking as I'm talking I can think a sentence ahead and I, I have a very long sentence structure I don't need to take a breath that's very very different to basic vocal communication so I think we should the the anatomy is telling us that some kind of vocal communication is pretty ancient but the the quality of that language is a different issue you know what they were talking about basically so perhaps chris what would be great is if you could just give a um a summary of the types of because we're talking i mean it's there's tongue and the you know the, the ability of our tongue to make these really complicated shapes but there's also things further down here now the voice in the voice box so could you just give us a very brief like what's the upgrade you need to make the complicated sounds and then and then what do we know about when it happened well, well yeah so there's there's been huge discussion over many years on this and people have attempted to reconstruct the the voice box of Neanderthals, and uh, one reconstruction gave them only 20% of the uh, vocal repertoire that we use today. But other people explain that there are many languages in the world that only use 20% of our vocal capacity. So on its own, that would not prove they they couldn't speak and have a language like ours. Um, Some of the reconstructions do have uh, a a shorter vocal tract, not so deep in terms of, of height. So you may have seen a, a, a quite amusing video on, I think on a BBC website of a, a, a reconstruction of how Neanderthals might have um, sung. And they sing with a, a, an amazing high-pitched voice. So not at all. Which is not what you expect. From <laughs> not you what you just described the these, these things with big, so, scary eyebrows. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's possible they did have high-pitched voices. That is certainly a possibility. But in terms of the complexity of their language, I think that comes out of social complexity. So I think that If they had complex societies, their language would have been complex, maybe not as complex as ours, but 
I think that for their day-to-day -day activities, uh, their life was complex enough that, that probably speech was there and some form of language was there. But how mm. <clears throat> I find it like it must be this is the sort this is the reason I don't do this kind of science because the idea that you would never see the vocal cords like you would never really be able to perfectly reconstruct how all how they moved even if you found a perfect specimen you know exactly how it moved and how elastic it all was and how it vibrated would be so you'd never know and I think that would drive me mad never knowing I'm going to go on to another question here which sort of follows on from that and it's going to be another it depends but have a go um it's from John Mulcahy and the question is when do we think we learn to lie oh that's very interesting definitely question. nothing in the fossil record for that right or is there uh I don't think we can think see we any can... see anything archaeologically or in fossil terms what we would have to do for that um is I think look at gross brain morphology um but also we would have to look at the behavior of our closest living relatives um and see what they're capable of of course they are not a direct proxy for Neanderthals or any other hominin but they do give us a range of the things that might have been shared by our common ancestor with them, which is like 7 million years ago, you know, very, very old. Um, so <clears throat> the fact that the more we look at, at bonobos and chimpanzees and other apes, the more similar they are to us in many ways in terms of tool capacity. But the question about cognition and the social complexity of do they understand what another is thinking, this idea of theory of mind. You have to know theory of mind to lie to someone. You have to understand someone else over there has a different view of the world to you. Um, and I believe that that has been shown in chimpanzees um, to some level. They don't appear to, to be able to sort of make their lies quite as, as fiendish as, as ours, maybe. But, I mean, could Neanderthals lie well I suppose another way to think about that is can do hunting animals like wolves can they make their prey think they're going to do something else in order well to I was going to say that actually, a it's reaction interesting. it's interesting because it actually it comes back to deception and deception mm -hmm. you could describe camouflage as deception and it's fine that might not be a question but it's a very slow slope isn't it from you know I'm deceiving you to I think you're going to think you're, it's mm. like you have to understand that you are you are a you're a sort of um, a shell, and the only the other person can only see the what you choose to reveal. Chris, what do you think about the the lying and deception? Yeah, so in terms of deception, yes, I, I think it's um, it's there to an extent with with chimpanzees, and I'm sure it was there with early humans. So there's an amusing video going around of a dog that uh, is on video deceiving its owner. So this dog, uh, the owner puts a bit of a little stick of food down for it um, and goes off and the dog eats the stick of food then goes over to the cupboard rummages in it picks out another bit of food and puts it back on the table where the other piece was <laughs> so the owner comes back you know it's all been videoed so because the owner can see very well on the video what's happened but it's remarkable so this dog is deceiving its owner in pretending it hasn't eaten one of the bits of food and it and uh, you know so if dogs can do that then i'm sure early humans could do it so there is deception and i suppose we can talk about cave art with early modern humans uh, mm -hmm. 30 or forty thousand years ago and there are these uh so-called hybrid human animal figurines and paintings so in a sense that could be examples of shamanism where people you know become a different creature they become an animal they become something else than human and so in a sense i guess that could be a, a form of social deception where people as, assume a different personality a different character even become a different creature is that would you agree becky um, yeah, I mean, I think the interpretation of the cave art is so so difficult. Um, you know, there's been a there's been a long tradition from from a Western archaeological view, and we tend to see it as based around the economics of hunting or sort of um, gods and goddesses. Whereas, if you look at indigenous understandings of hunting in some ways there is no boundary between the prey and the hunter it's much more about relationality and there are understandings of cycles of of blood and materiality that goes from the body of the consumed through to the hunter so i wouldn't want to say about that but i think coming back to the language thing actually because you know to lie you need to be able to talk um in that sense um 
we didn't mention that there is ge the genetic aspect to the language as well. And I think that might be where we see some of the nuances um, that are different between us and Neanderthals. So there was this discovery that Neanderthals had um, one uh, gene that, that was very similar to or exactly the same, actually, as a gene that appears to be extremely strongly involved in language in us. This is the FOXP2. However, more recent research has shown that we... Um, we possess a different sort of protein version of it. So ours doesn't function the same. So, if, you know, even the genetics, we need to get more deeper and deeper into what that is actually telling us about very subtle differences. So perhaps Neanderthals had some kind of uh, speech and they could they could lie, but perhaps we might have been even better at it than them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's the sort of question everyone wants to know the answer to, and there's never an easy answer. Um, so we've got a question here from John Brown, which is, what's the latest thinking on why it was Homo sapiens that survived, and the Neanderthals, and the Denisovans, and Homo floresiensis, all different, very different time periods, why did they all die out, and we're the only ones left? Was it inevitable that just one would win? Wow. Uh... Who wants to go first on that one? <laughs> Start it off, if you like. So, yeah, I mean, the short answer is that is one of the big questions that we don't have the answer to. And, and we may build up an answer for Neanderthals and why they died out that might involve the cl climate change and low population numbers and low genetic diversity. And we turned up and competed with them and it didn't take a lot to push them over the edge. But the thing is, we've got to explain also the disappearance of the Denisovans over in the Far East, and they genetically seem to have been more diverse. Um, they covered maybe a wider range of impacts. They also disappeared. Homo erectus disappeared. We're not exactly sure when. Um, and uh, so and Robin, Robin has just reappeared. So yeah, we're, Robin, Robin we're talking about the disappearance of species. So they can reappear after. You had just reappeared. <laughs> Lazarus species, when they seem to go extinct and they reappear. And here's one of them, Robin. Hello. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that... It's, it's going to be a it's not going to be down to one thing. It's probably a complex of several things interacting. And, and Becky, what do you what did the what did there have to be? Did there have to be one winner? That's another thing. Are, are we such an aggressive species that we were always just going to smash everyone else to a pulp, or is it just coincidence? Um, um, it's really hard to say because, <clears throat> um, sort of the the whole what happened to the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are like this. Uh, they they act as, as as the foil to us, you know, in so many ways, and and they're like the um, the prototype of the extinct thing that we have sort of known about for a long time. And so they've questions about what happened to them have dominated. But it is a really good point, you know, why is it that after forty thousand years ago? Uh, we seem to have cleared everybody else out. I think maybe um, perhaps Homo floresiensis might have hung around a bit longer. Perhaps in Southeast Asia, there may have been uh, some groups related to the Denisovans a little bit later. We're not sure. But certainly, you know, by at very latest 20,000 years ago, everyone else was gone. Um, and it does also seem that something of a coincidence that you know, when we enter new continents, we also seem to, to wipe out some of the animals. Um, I think I think there is a sort of a pattern there that doesn't look great for, for our ability to um, sort of, yeah, have a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's an issue. Go on, yeah, Chris. worth adding another bit of complexity because, of course, as Becky's mentioned already, there were earlier interactions between modern humans and Neanderthals, or at least their earlier lineages. So we think that there might be a Homo sapiens fossil in Greece that's over 200,000 years old. And then we get a Neanderthal after it in the same site. So there you've got the reverse thing happening. A Homo sapiens seems to be there, an early out of Africa exit, and it, it's replaced by a Neanderthal. And in the Middle East, you've got modern humans at over 100,000 years ago, and then you've got Neanderthals. So... In the earlier phases, even when modern humans got out of Africa early on, they didn't replace, it seems, those other species. So I think something did change after 60,000 years ago. And I think we should home in on that and try and pin down what happened afterwards, what happened for the most recent out of Africa that, that led to our success, if you could call what we're doing to the planet now, success. Now, Helen, while I've been gone, of course, I've got no idea you've been what... asking. So I'm going to presume that you haven't asked yourself a question about whale poo. I haven't. 
<laughs> Good. So this is from Thomas, who over the last, as he said, over the last eight months of Sunday Science Q&As has got more and more intrigued by this as it is a subject that's cropped up quite a few times. And his question for you is, is there any danger at all of over fertilization from too much whale poo if we overfish at different levels so it's left unconsumed? Um, so probably not. And the reason for that is several fold. First of all, the ocean is really good at using up nutrients. It tends to be nutrient poor and there's plenty of there's plenty of things that aren't fish. So you have phytoplankton, which are the, the algae and, you know, things that photosynthesize. And then you have the things that eat them, which are zooplankton, which can be far too small to see. And then there's things that eat them and then the fish are sort of quite a long way up. So the first thing is that there are lots of things that can eat stuff that isn't that aren't fish and, and all of that would probably survive quite well without fish. The other thing is that nutrients in the ocean tend to sink. So um, what happens is that after you've had some poo and you fertilize everything and obviously there are other ways to bring nutrients to the surface. We might be talking about this in the Christmas lecture. Um, the uh, anything that doesn't get used up eventually just just settles down to the bottom of the ocean and actually the problem of the ocean is getting nutrients up to the surface it is not natural eutrophication doesn't tend to happen that's the process that you get where you know there's loads of fertilizers in rivers and they for example you know the rhine in germany there's an enormous area at the front of that where it's been over fertilized and there's oxygens run out and it's all dead and a bit horrid um you don't tend to get that in the ocean because the ocean is really poor in nutrients in most places so in the center of the ocean it's just not going to be a problem so no need to worry that the whales are pooing too much. And also remember, there used to be a lot more whales. Um, so we are, we are currently deficient in whale poo. OK, right. So if anything goes the other way, that's no. great to know. That's given people another vivid image of the sea, which we don't always see on the blue planet. Um, this is from Craven Science, who would like to know, is adult onset lactose intolerance due to survival benefit for the young? Are there other examples of where adult negative physiological effects increase child survival stroke development? Um, Rebecca, would you like to answer that? I think that might have to be a Chris one, to be honest. That sounds a little bit... <laughs> You need a geneticist, need a for, geneticist it from, for it, from really. Uh, one no, we'll get Steve Jones again. He can make milkshakes boring as well. Sure that one. He's he's milkshakes. Um, but yes, I think what's interesting is that the um, it looks like the uh, the lactose intolerance is something that obviously you see once you've got it, uh, once you're able to tolerate lact lactose as adults, uh, it's obviously beneficial. Um, and what's interesting is that dairy farming seems to be present in Europe uh, for, uh, and Becky, I think will know more about this than me, it seems to be present in Europe for several thousand years before we get the prevalence of the, uh, the genetics that shows people have developed the ability to digest um, milk as, as adults. So there is an assumption that Maybe they were making cheese or, or some other product that uh, was, you know, they could tolerate it even without the right bits of DNA that allowed them to digest it properly as an adult. Well, I so, always wonder as well with the whole cheese thing. I mean, it's not my area at all because it's later prehistory, but, um, you know, we don't have a great tolerance for alcohol, but we still have a and you know maybe they were just really into their cheese and they didn't care if it made them sick. I don't know. <laughs> That's a lovely. I am never, never eating, eating cheese again <laughs> sometime <laughs> later. Maybe just a dairy lead chaser then. <laughs> um, we've there got uh, another Purdy 80 would like to know could hominids have evolved independently somewhere else, or is the out of Africa model pretty locked down as the only source of humans? Rebecca? I think, um, in terms of if they're talking about, talking about Homo sapiens as the source of Homo sapiens, then yes, I think unquestionably the earliest fossils we see and the sort of the connections in terms of anatomy that places it in Africa but not in one region we now believe that um, the emergence of homo sapiens is more of a sort of a mosaic process of of different uh, features emerging in different populations but that there was connection between them so it's it's much more of a of a messy interesting thing that potentially is is involving the whole continent but in terms of where the hominin lineage emerges um there is no hints anywhere that um <clears throat> that Africa was not, I think, the oldest, but certainly there is there are early apes um in Asia and, and in Europe. So um I it's not again, it's not my field. It's not I'm not sort of early, early, early stuff, but I don't understand that that there's any evidence that would suggest otherwise. I think Chris would probably um agree uh, with that. Chris? 
Yes, yeah, so there are some uh, European ape fossils which some people think uh, could be close to the ancestry of, of, of hominins. So there is some controversy. Uh, I think most people probably still favour Africa. Um, but in terms of human lineages and human species, um, yes, certainly some of them originated uh, pretty certainly outside of Africa. So Homo floresiensis, of course, the, this thing nicknamed the Hobbit, um, seems to have evolved on Flores, a lineage that maybe was there for more than a million years. So that had an origin outside of Africa. And um, possibly Homo heidelbergensis. We don't know where that originated. That may have originated outside of Africa. And even the common ancestor for us and Neanderthals, um, many people assume that that must have been in Africa, but actually we don't know that it was. The common ancestor could have lived in Europe, in Asia or in Africa, and then spread from there to the other regions. So, you know, once we get back beyond Homo sapiens, I think, you know, there's a lot of evidence that Homo sapiens underwent its main evolution in Africa, but before that, yes, the other regions could have been could have been important. Yeah, we do have um, a side from fossils. the fossils. There is now um, from China. There is a a, um, a dated sequence of um, deposits in a massive cliff, which has stone tools in, and they are older than two million years. So there must have there there certainly were extremely ancient dispersals. We believe from Africa, though then. The descendants of those sort of speciated within Asia, and that's the Homo floresiensis and, and other things. So, so I think, but in terms of where did it all begin? So far, I think Africa looks certainly to be the main candidate. But I, you know, there have been scholars that have been arguing for decades that Asia has been neglected, and it and it hasn't. And certainly, we are seeing that there is a lot more going on there than um, than was understood before. And of course, looking for the hominid extraterrestrial DNA that many of us <laughs> were in the in the sixties and early seventies. Thank you both very much, uh, and thank you everyone for sending a question. I'm sorry we we've had a bit of a yeah weird technical day on lots of different fronts, uh, which hopefully doesn't bode badly for then attempting to do a twenty four hour show with one hundred and seventeen uh, different guests. I'm sure that's going to be fine. Uh, do go and find out more about that. We still need more supporters for that. Uh, we are doing it for various charities. You can find out about those charities at cosmicshambles.com. Um, Helen, I should just ask you: Are you able to give us any sneak preview ideas yet about the Christmas lecture? or is everything still very secret it's all quite secret but what i am going to do is so i think i don't think anybody really understands what the i don't think anyone in the public eye is really talking about what the ocean actually is and how it works and that is what i'm going to talk about so so i i i, I wanted to change everyone's perspective on the ocean and it's not news to oceanographers but nobody talks about it and i really care about this so basically i'm getting a lot of bees out of my bonnet um, yes, but you are going to see the ocean differently because it is not what people think it is. That's what's what's great about the Christmas lecture is the moment you've said that you know, said, and perhaps you could actually wear an enormous bonnet filled with bees because they do love their props. He is hoping. I know you've been working on that. Oh, the hope couture of this year's show is going to be fantastic. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much to Trent Burton for producing this as usual. Uh, as I said, on Wednesday, we'll be doing a genetic shambles with Steve Jones. Send in your questions. See if there's any question you can ask him which doesn't eventually lead to him talking about snails. Uh, we have tried this so many times. It is almost utterly impossible. We, we did a show on the Infinite Mind Cage which had nothing to do with snails, but he was one of the guests. It was only about about snails by the end of it um i must recommend uh i mean chris is a great writer too but i think rebecca has the most recent book out and uh, as i said I, I i read kindred and and talked to her on a science shambles uh, about it and it is a very very beautifully written book and um, and really worth reading uh also mentioned as well as on wednesday uh a brief uh it's a non-cosmic shambles thing but on friday i'm doing an interview with reese shearsmith and steve pemberton online a live interview about the the book of the first three uh series of inside number nine scripts and uh, that should be somewhere on uh, on a Waterstones website, I think. Thanks very much, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next Sunday. All right.